Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Up next on Another View, a deeper dive into the gun violence that has our community on edge. The governor restores voting rights to thousands of ex-offenders. Norfolk's newly elected mayor makes history. Donald Trump trumps his opponents in his fight to the White House. And comedian Larry Wilmore calls the president the N-word. Lots of fodder for the Another View Roundtable. Roger, Carol, Delcino, and Will are here with plenty to say. Stay tuned. The Another View Roundtable is next, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. Lots of things happening, good and bad, that directly affect the African-American community. So let's get started. Let's meet with our Another View roundtable. Roger Chesley is a columnist with the Virginian Pilot, and you can read his columns every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Hey, Roger. How you doing, Barbara? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm hanging in there. Good. I hear you a little son. Horse voice and all. (laughs) Well, we appreciate you being here. Carol Pretlow is a political science professor professor with Norfolk State University. Hi, Carol. Hi, Barbara. Uh, exams all over? Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Delcino Miles is owner of the Miles Agency, a niche PR marketing firm. Hey, Delcino, welcome back to the round table. What's up, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a reference to something we'll talk about later in today's show. Oops. And Will Levis, he's an author, journalist, talk show host. You can hear him every Wednesday at noon on 88.1 WHOV FM Hampton University Radio. Always a pleasure, Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much. And, you know, before we get started with our, our discussions, I do have to say um, yesterday was the National Day of Prayer. Um, for the country, and we had a um, event at our church last night at First Baptist Berkeley, and I had the the honor and pleasure of praying for journalists. So I want you, Roger, and you will in particular, to mm-hmm. know <laughs> that I had you in my mind Thank you. As, as we Thank were. You. Because because I appreciate prayer. Prayer. I need Roger prayer. and that Virginian pilot absolutely <laughs> needs prayer. <laughs> uh, as we were talking about journalists in national, local, international, and and all of the journalists who work very hard to bring us the news every day. So, all righty. Hampton Roads in general and Norfolk and Newport News in particular are experiencing a particularly violent crime wave, 33 shootings and six homicides in Newport News since January uh, and 19 homicides in Norfolk. We asked for the number of shootings, but the city didn't give us a chance, give us uh, that information. The vast majority of shootings and homicides were black on black crime and majority African-American and men. What are we going to do to stop the violence, Will? We talked we about do? this so many times <laughs> on this show. It's, it's, it's jobs, it's multifaceted, but a lot of it comes down very much to if you have employment, if you have a way of taking care of yourself, um, it is is very a whole lot m- less likely that you're going to be out on the street um, settling scores, peddling dope, and shooting people. Mm -hmm. If you remember when we were younger and they had things like summer jars for you for Mm -hmm. different infusions that went into the community that gave people opportunities to learn a trade, Mm -hmm. to get some money, Mm -hmm. to be able to uh, buy the things that they wanted, the things that they need, you you didn't have these kinds of numbers. Mm -hmm. So where you you don't have that, regardless of the community, you're going to have these kinds of numbers. So you look at, you start looking at what's happening in some or white communities where people are out of work and poverty, that correlation is there, you're going to see the same types of numbers. Same thing going on. Roger, the, the, a different twist to this, also that some of this has been police-involved shootings. And sure. uh, in Norfolk, the um, uh, police chief turned over the investigation to Virginia State Police. And NAACP says this is a great act of transparency. Yeah, he... Um uh, you know, he had been talking and, and wondering whether that was the right thing to do, if he should try to do that more often. And there is some concern that when the department investigates its own, uh, especially when a homicide takes place, that uh, there's just not going to be the same confidence by the general public that it's going to be an independent investigation. 
And so uh, we'll see if this is going to be something that the other departments do. Uh, unfortunately, Norfolk seems, it, it seems like a lot of the homicides that take place in, in police involved in shootings often happen in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had some in Virginia Beach as well. Um, so that's not a bad step, but piggybacking on some of the things that Will said, mm -hmm. uh, you need options, you need to have this, this sense of African Americans who, uh, sometimes I wonder, do we know who we are? I, I wrote a column about this probably about a month ago where there was a shooting at a metro station in Washington, D.C., and these two young men, one was, I believe, 15, was the victim, the 17-year-old was the shooter, and the 17-year-old the seemed to think that the 15-year-old looked at him the wrong way. Mm -hmm. They didn't know each other. Uh, probably only a, a several minutes passed from the time, uh, the, maybe five minutes total. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that was very striking about the particular case was that the, the alleged shooter gave his uh, fast food to one of his friends before he ran off. So he seemed like he cared more about the fast food than <laughs> this young man he just shot. Mm. And, and you just wonder, do we know who we are? Do we know the struggles that we um, faced mm -hmm. in, this, in this country over centuries? Do we understand that, yes, we might not always have jobs, but that doesn't mean that you deny uh, a life to somebody else over mostly nonsense. Um, and, and that's probably the most frustrating thing that I that I see. In Del Cino, when when you look at the the whole idea of of certain neighborhoods and people not seeing anything else other than the violence that they see on a da daily basis, um, and and then the snitch factor also that that comes into that. Do um, you think that plays even more of a role of why we're so trigger happy? In, as opposed to trying to talk it out, work it out, I think even what, fist fight it out. I mean, well, <laughs> which we used well, to do. Well, obviously there's anger management issues, but uh, some of it, I uh, agree with Will, some of it's economically based. But then we, there's another um, sort of um, secret in the black community about mental illness. Uh, so sometimes that plays into it. And then we're seeing the maturation of the children of children growing up. So if, if you're a child, having a child, what parenting skills do you have? And what do you instill into that child if you're immature yourself? Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the product of a, of a teen mom, but she had a lot of family support to raise us. But if you don't have that kind of familial support uh, to teach morals, to have a, a strong male uh, father figure in your, in your life, uh, you know, you said you said you were at your church. If you know, church used to be the backbone yeah. of the community, mm -hmm. and everybody was your parent back then. And so now it's it's uh, people have this attitude. It's it's not my problem. That's his son. Or they'll talk about, uh, or they'll just dismiss the the, the fact because it still burns me. I don't know about you all. I think we're all about right in the same generation where you see a kid acting up in the grocery store, you want to do something. But now, <laughs> you're now you got lawsuits, <laughs> and, and so and and you and you got the public opinion about who was the football player that got. Uh, um, it was Adrian. Peterson. Oh, Adrian. Yeah, Peterson. for spanking yeah. his child. He wasn't abusing his child. He was disciplining his child. But he was, uh, he was just uh, raked across the coals. Mm -hmm. And so, if that's the kind of attitude we have about disciplining children and teaching them morals, then uh, it's no wonder they don't know what to do, Roger. When you mm -hmm. said that, you know, this this kid doesn't know the difference between the value of a life and the value of a of, of fast food. Who's teaching them? Mm -hmm. Um, at one point, and I think that's another area that we've dropped the ball, education and the schools fulfilled the gap. You, so we had churches, then we had the schools from elementary on through high school, that if you did something or if there was a problem, the school, the teacher would talk to the parents, look, this is what I've observed. But now when you go to the classrooms, I've been astounded at the classrooms I've visited and the Teachers feel powerless. They feel like, oh, I can't say anything because then I'll get fired. Then, of course, they come to uh, a, a, a college or a university, and we have not altered our perspectives. We think that, okay, this is what a, a university is supposed to be like, forgetting that some of the students don't come from this academic setting. They need help. They need guidance. And so it's a vicious circle. The NAACP created a hotline um, because they want people to call in. People have not been reporting any information about these shootings. And the hotline number um, 
for them is uh, the Norfolk NAACP, by the way, mm-hmm. uh, 757-749-3398 or 757-692-9222. Now, I, I found that I, I, interesting. I, yeah, because, I mean, the police, uh, uh, the, all the police departments uh, share in the crime line here, mm-hmm. um, one 888 one eight 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 lock you up. up. I mean, it, it's it's almost you can say it almost in your sleep. You hear it so often. So and and you don't have to give your name to that. So I'm wondering if this is really going to uh, get anybody who ordinarily wouldn't respond to the other yeah, the, think, to the other phone number. We'll see. Ahead, I, I was going to say that I think that people need to understand that a lot of times when these crimes happen, people know who committed the crime. Mm-hmm. It's if it's in your community, people know who committed the crime. And people feel if they can't be protected <laughs> by sharing that they know who committed the crime, then that's one of the reasons why they don't call. Another reason why they don't call is because they figure that this is street justice. And so street justice mm-hmm. is, going, is going to take care of who committed that crime. And the other thing I, I, I'll just like to caution us is to mm-hmm. not speak about this as if this is a black community only it's problem. Not. It's not. Because you find this... The reason why it's so prominent here in Hampton Roads is because black people are disproportionately poor to their numbers or disproportionately uneducated. But where you find communities where you got that that combination of poverty, lack of education or undereducation, broken families, Mm -hmm. lack of jobs, Mm -hmm. people start feeding on each other. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, is sad to say, that is a natural, a predictable outcome that you can expect. So now that begins to beg to differ. Well, if that's a predictable outcome, then what are we doing to change those dynamics? Because we know if you if you have that condition, regardless of race, that's going to be your outcome. But, you know, that's a very interesting point that you bring up. And because the question is, if, if you've been listening to the news a lot lately with the heroin epidemic, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now that it has reached oh. middle class white <laughs> yeah. community, there's a lot of discussion it, about, you know, you, the different kinds of drugs to get them off and so forth and so on. But it, that, it's a very, um, ahead, in, in some ways, it's encouraging and in other ways, it's disconcerting. If you go back and look at some of the newspaper and uh, broadcast news coverage of crack, say, 25, 30 years ago, and contrast that with some of the coverage now of the heroin epidemics, the stereotype then was, okay, this is a black inner city problem. There are crack babies and crack moms. We really don't have to deal with it. And it, it was one more of shame and disgust, I think, at that time. Compare that to the coverage now, it's, it's much more empathetic. And, uh, you know, several columnists have written about this whole issue, but it, it is... Um, I'm glad there is that concern about people today and that, yes, drug addiction is an addiction and it's a problem, but I, I wish some of that same empathy had been given but Roger, 25, 30 years you ago. You know why? Uh, of well, because <laughs> the newsroom reflects <laughs> white middle class values. Barbara and I know this. You know this. Mm. It reflects white middle class values. So that's what you see in your newspaper, the white middle class view of the world. So those of us who come from outside of that and gone to college and seen different things or traveled overseas, be like, wait a minute. Well, oh, hey, hey this is, there's other things going on. This is not this is not the tone. This is not what the majority of America thinks. And when you start talking like that in the newsroom, what happens, Roger? You often you get ostracized. That's right. Yeah. You, you're no longer part of the club. And so when you're no longer part of the club, what happens? You don't ascend to become an editor. You, you don't be sent to become the editor of the editorial page or get a, or get a coveted columnist gig because you're not part of the club. And that's what we see. And also, that's the disruption that we're seeing going on on a political view, is that people are not paying attention to, the, to what they see in coming out of the newspaper, that only white middle class view coming out of the newspaper. They're not paying attention to I that I see you nodding your head, Delcina. Oh, with Will? Yeah. Oh, I don't agree with anything Will says. Yeah, you, you better not, because you started off with the wrong foot coming up in here. Yeah, you'll be all right. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, again... Um, I, I think that uh, the issue, we're going back to family, the very core values. Uh, I think most of us grew up around strong families, and we've seen the breakdown of the family. I think that's, that's really the, 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 the core of what's going on here. These kids, they're, they're finding money for something, Will. They're finding money to buy guns. 
Um, so no one's giving out free guns. So they're finding money to, to buy uh, Jordan, Air, Air Jordans. They're finding money to do what they want to do. How they're not, obviously they're not doing it working at McDonald's. So I think that uh, there needs to be more collaboration with our, with our families and with law enforcement and to open up those doors of communication because there's too much mystery about each side. Uh, law enforcement needs to be more transparent uh, and the public needs to be more forthcoming. Uh, to do that, they, there needs to be some uh, sense of trust and there's no so trust You're there blaming right the victim. His family's <laughs> under attack. How, how are families I'm under not attack? Blaming okay, the victim. Let her, let Fam- her answer. Families I, are I'm under not, attack because families have I'm, been disrupted economically. I'm not blaming the victim. I'm blaming the shooter. The shooter is the one who bought the gun and but pulled the trigger. But you said that that's the root of the family. You said that's the it breakdown is. of the family. It is. So it what is. broke down the family? Who knows? I'm telling you who bro- what broke down the family. I'm of what not broke blaming down white fam- America for breaking I'm, down no, black families. I didn't, no, I didn't say. <laughs> okay. That's not what I said. I'm saying what broke down the family. Look at what broke down and starts to break down the family. Roger and I and all of us came up in families where one parent was able to make enough income to be able to support the family in many cases. Right. Is that even remotely Possible in this day and age among working class people, and, and even in my family, well, both my parents were. And both, both my parents too. were too, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. So we, but we came up in an era where that was possible. Yeah. Is that even yeah. remotely possible now? And then what about some of the policies that happened that took black males out of the family? What okay, about well, some let of the let policies? Policies been on the attack. Let, let What's your question? question? What question do you want me to respond well, to? Well, I actually, what broke down the family? I just gave you an example of. You're saying that the families have to fix themselves and partner. I mean, the families no, are under quite. attack. I th- okay. I, no, no, no. Say, no. Families, really, families are accountable for themselves, quite frankly. I'm not looking for government to fix anything uh, as far as my family's concerned. I... I can take my own kid to college. I'm not looking for free college. I can send my own kid to college. Uh, and it's up to me to make sure that child has enough of me and my values in them to make the right decisions, not to take a life. I'm not blaming the victim. I'm blaming the person that's perpetrating the crime. And so whether they got a daddy or not, look at the, the young man he, who was not African-American who took out his whole family in Chesapeake. So yeah. so what was the problem there? It's either mental illness, no, no, it's either yeah. poor, poor, fam, poor family values, or there, or some of these other issues that are going on, external factors, whether it's some people want to blame media, some people want to blame uh, the drug problem. So poverty. it's, it, yeah, poverty. poverty. Oh, but in this case, that, so I, I think if you look at who's shooting who, I don't think they're all poor, quite frankly. I don't think all the victims are poor. I don't think all the perpetrators are poor. We're just looking at the, the, the bottom line number, this many shootings. Who are they really? We okay. haven't taken a look at that. Let's talk to Ryan in Portsmouth. Hi, Brian. You're on the air. Hi there. Um, you know, I, I I just wanted to say I agree with with the lady. I don't know what her name is, but um, you know, her I'm, name I'm is Delcino person, Miles. I, I can't pretend to know what's going on in the black community, really. I grew up in Portsmouth. You know, it's kind of a kind of a more there's kind of more black people there than most other cities. And I grew up in. Hello. Well, we lost him. He's gone for some reason. I'm so sorry. If he calls back, we'll take him. Take him again. But, At any rate, Carol, I'll let you have the last word well, on this. Well, I think all of this is true, but what really impressed me about what you said was the community role. Okay, so I understand that there's a breakdown in families. I understand the economic situation. But then what do we do? We look to a community. That's where we look to in the past. So what can the community do now? We've got the NACP. We've got the Urban League. We've got these other organizations. And we've got churches. And Bill would say, it's up to us. And by the way, Bill, I think think it is Mm -hmm. up to us, but, you know, that's why I like groups uh, like Teens with a Purpose Mm -hmm. that that has been working so hard for so long Mm -hmm. and and takes people, you know, teenagers, whatever the the circumstances, and says, here are some programs that we're going to do. Here are some things you can be involved in. Even if it's not poetry, they've got gardens that they they work on and other programs. And And I think it's so great if we can... Uh, you know, highlight these programs. And, and I think all of us try to do that as mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. when we see the opportunity because there's a lot of groups that are working and we just don't always know about all the work all that the they work do. they're doing because they're in the community. Mark joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Mark. You're on the air. Yeah, good afternoon. Hi. Yeah, I, I just totally agree with uh, Will on this point. Uh, I mean, to the extent that, and that's why I'm really having a problem with you know, with Hillary Clinton, uh, is that, you know, Bill Cl- President Clinton put a few things in place that just 
just exacerbated and just tore down our community. Uh, we talk about the welfare reform. You know, that was massive to our community. Uh, did we need to do something? Yes. Do we need to do something? Yes. However, that whole system was on a false premise that you would take someone who was on welfare, invest federal dollars to train them into a minimum wage job. So now they got, they're got they working at minimum wage with family and dependents, and they got to find a way to spend parts of their minimum wage funds to take care of their child. Mm-hmm. So who really benefits in that particular case? Well, somebody like Walmart or some of the other corporate giants that basically pay the employees minimum wage, work them under 30 hours so they don't get benefits, and then the government still has to compensate maybe not as fully as they mm-hmm would have if they weren't working minimum wage on a minimum wage job, just like home health care, they're getting minimum wage. These jobs are kind of dead in in many regards. And then add on that, you take the crime bill, which was just like putting an 800-pound gorilla onto the dissipation of the black family even more. So now you have our males that basically now have been just eradicated out of our neighborhood for an almost generational type of time. We're talking like 15, 25 years worth of basically just non-existence because they're serving time for a non-violent offense. Okay. Then to add on top of that, when that male gets out of jail, because he had a non-violent drug offense, <laughs> he can no longer even apply to get food stamps to get back on his feet. So Will is exactly right. Preach. And- okay. <laughs> Mark, Look. I'm going to have to cut you off just because of time, but uh, but we get your point, and I'm going to let the roundtable respond to you. Thanks so much for the call. We yeah, appreciate yeah. it. And Go again, ahead, and what he's breaking down, it's not if you're saying that people don't have any personal responsibility not saying that at all family is absolutely critical but it's exactly what he just said when you are under attack by these kinds of policies and how they affect you you can't now just turn around and say well you should pick yourself up by your bootstraps my goodness look what he just broke down i witnessed that growing up in brownsville brooklyn new york growing up in baltimore come on we saw that happening and wondering what's going on around us as men are disappearing. And then we have people who let who let the other policies off the hook by just saying, if the family would just get together, if the churches would just do what the churches should do, we'd be all right. That's letting people off the hook. Be Don't more say no, I'm going to let you have the last word. Then we got to move on to the next topic. I ain't trusting governor to do squat. Next subject. Okay. Well, with that, if you're okay. just joining us, <laughs> we're talking about current events with the Another View Roundtable. Roger Chesley with the Virginian Pilots, Carol Pretlow with NSU, Delcino Miles with the Miles Agency, and Will Levis with WHOVFM, Hampton University Radio. And Bill Thomas, by the way, wanted to be with us today, but he is stuck in D.C. Um, and could not get a flight out. So that's he's such a he's world not, traveler. He's such a world traveler. We miss him. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Governor McAuliffe restored stores voting rights to more than 200,000 ex-felons use an executive order to do it, but there are some complications, aren't there, Roger? There sure are, but, uh, and as I wrote earlier this week, I, I think, uh, politics aside, he did the right thing on this. Uh, there is some, uh, there's some difference of agreement of whether it's legal, what he did in issuing the executive order, but every time this issue comes up, you know, you go back to the Constitutional Convention of 1901-02 that enshrined this and, and basically put people who have been convicted of felonies, uh, you know, at a disadvantage for the rest of their lives. And a lot of these felons are nonviolent felons or uh, cases of fraud or, or check kiting or bad checks or things of this nature and, you know, have to go through all these steps. And the Republicans, obviously, because they think and they probably know that a lot of the people who would get their rights back are black uh, and they usually vote for Democrats. They're concerned about this. But I think of the decades, the more than a century, such people have been disenfranchised. And it's, it's time to to end this. We're one of the wor- worst states in the country Preach, Roger. on this. So and what was the root of, of why this law is even there? Oh, was it, the it, it, it? it was racism yeah. and it was, yeah. it, you know, coming out of uh, Reconstruction and, and trying to keep blacks from the, the ballot box oh, but in the gov- early but 1900s. Government, but, gov- but government policies don't matter. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Go ahead. So. Go ahead. <laughs> what a no, segue. What exactly. a segue. What's the message that's being sent? Okay, you did a crime. We we convicted you properly of the crime. Mm-hmm. Here's the time you that served. Is, and you served. finished the sentence. Served. You right. finished the sentence. Mm-hmm. Now you should be able to be restored. Stored. Think of what the brother just said. You coming back, and I should be able to get a job and re. Enter myself into the community and, and become be a, a productive be, citizen. Become again. a productive citizen? Mm-hmm. No, we don't want that. I, I can't tell you how many people I get either calls or emails from after I write about this topic who say, Can you help me or get me in contact with the people so that I can get my rights back? I I want a chance to become a full member. I want to do the right thing. Not not everybody is like that, but uh, you know, every time I do a column like this, I usually get calls from people saying, Hey, I want to I want to do this. But I haven't anybody... voted before, and I want to get this opportunity to do this. But but because he had to do this through executive order as opposed to being able to get it through the General, General Assembly, Assembly, whomever comes into office after him can, can resist this, this, right? And, yes. and, and that's the other thing I just want <laughs> yeah. to say about the General Assembly. The, the bless her heart, the late uh, State Senator Yvonne Miller mm-hmm. tried year after she year did. to to get a constitutional amendment through and, mm-hmm. and a referendum, a voter referendum through. And there were always excuses where it would get through the Senate and it, would get, and it wouldn't get through the House. So the Republicans can't have it both ways. Either you're for this and trying to bring people back into the system or you just don't care and you want to be called, you want to be linked or, with, with racism. Okay, or or Carol, you're protecting your own political behind so that in the next election you won't be faced with some people who got out and might vote in opposition to you. Okay. Anything you want uh, I don't to have a problem with, with us, um, what governor did. Um, I think he should have done it through the General Assembly, quite frankly, too, um, so the next governor can't come in and, and undo it. Um, but uh, t- if, if these folks have um, men and women, I'm not assuming they're all men. Mostly um, men. Yeah, it's mostly, mostly men. Yeah. But whoever, these, these former offenders uh, have that, and they serve their time, they've done everything, they've jumped through the hoops, and they are hoops. Um, that uh, give them a chance to um, get reintroduced to society and, and do the right thing and support their families. Now, now, Barbara, think about how this message plays out on the street level right mm-hmm. now. The message is I can do my time, the crime, all of that, and still come out and still not be <laughs> reentered. Now, look at the person who is on the street level right now on the brink of committing a crime or not committing a crime, frustrated, trying to get a job, thinking about now somebody's approaching them to sling some dope to make some... What is the message you're sending to that person? All right. If, you, if you're saying if you can't vote, if we keep taking you things still away. Not a part you of still, society. You're still not going to be a yeah. part of society whether you you're go in or not. Yeah. Right. You yeah. damn it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So what you're going to say, you're desperate. You're trying to eat right now. Well, I'll take my chance with right now because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's right. very, very true. So who's benefiting financially from, from that being set up that way? They'll see no. Because government policies don't business. matter, right? It, government no, policies don't matter. Actually, this, this is a government policy that's coming into play now. So to, I guess to, a lot to, of people want it this way because they want certain people to be ended up in a prison system and to disappear and to make money off them and to never come Or they want to help their preferred candidate to get elected. So, well, right, so I, they can... I, I, I just, go ahead, Roger. Just, you know, no, uh, hang on in, one in, in preparing time. for the, the column that I wrote earlier this week, I mean, I, I went back through a lot of Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, mm-hmm. and you wonder... You know, how many people, when they do come out and they have to sign that box that says, are you a convicted felon? Right. You're, you're basically taking a lot of people out of the workforce that way. And As a matter of fact, didn't the federal government change that, um, took the box away? they got rid of that yeah, That's box. one of the things yeah, that that's one of the yeah, things that federal government happen. might not be, the, the, right. the local and state governments might not right. be private employers. Right, right. So, exactly. So, you know, you're making it that much more difficult for those those folks to get jobs and you're also in a sense boosting up other folks you know making it easier for some folks to get That's jobs right. making it tougher for eliminating folks competition right eliminating mm-hmm. competition speaking of competition <laughs> Norfolk Hampton Chesapeake and Williamsburg sorry Williamsburg people from the last time I mentioned this because I made a mistake and did not mention that Williamsburg had an election so I apologize <laughs> so Norfolk Hampton Chesapeake and Williamsburg all held elections this week history was made in Norfolk as mayor-elect Kenny Alexander becomes the first African-American mayor in the city he downplays this history stating he's a mayor for all of Norfolk something most African-American firsts have to do don't they Carol 
Yes, they do. And I don't think, I think that he was being modest. And he, of course, as President Obama said, I am the president of all the people. He is the mayor of all the people. But the reality is that he will be dealing with a number of problems that affect the African-American community. And because of that, and his accessibility, he came to one of my classes, not as a campaign uh, vote for me, but just to explain certain policies of city government a few months ago. And it had a dramatic effect. So I think mm -hmm. this is a reason to be hopeful. Okay. Um, Super Ward 7, uh, Roger, um, Angela Williams Graves won again handily. Right. Um, <laughs> she and yeah. um, the she did not support Kenley Alexander. No, she, she supported didn't. And Andy. She, Andy Protegero, one of the, uh, and, uh, you know, give Alexander credit also in the win. I mean, he got more than 50% in the three yes, race. race. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's tantamount to a landslide. And, and it also means he has a, a, a strong mandate. When he comes into and to be office. the mayor for everyone, but but it is going to be interesting. There there seems to be a lot of history there uh, from the the vice mayor, the current vice mayor, and the soon to be uh, mayor. I, I guess they've known each other for a long time. Um, her husband and uh, Kenny Alexander, they're, they're both in the funeral, funeral home business. business yeah. <laughs> so there there <laughs> seems to be a little bit of tension in there. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> she was quoted in the pilot as saying, quote, put the politics behind us and work together for the best interests of the citizens. Remember, I represent half the city. Well, well, he he represents the whole city. He represents the whole city. Um, and, and the important thing is you have an eight-member uh, council you're going to need at least five okay. votes to go Seven. forward. Uh, it's, no, it's, it's, it's eight in Norfolk. It's eight, eight in Norfolk. Norfolk. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know. It's a numbers need, game. Right. You, oh, yeah. you want to be able With to get, uh, you know, you want to be able to get enough people to back your particular position so you can move forward. We had the consummate politician who preceded mm -hmm. Uh, Kenny Alexander, we had Paul Frame, who had been there forever. 22 years. And, and, and prior to that was also on the council before he was mayor. So, uh, and he had the power of per persuasion, always being involved, uh, always being seeming, seemingly everywhere at the same time and knowing what was going on in the city. So, new dynamic, it, it would be good if the council can work together. We've, we've seen some dysfunctional councils in recent years, Portsmouth. So, 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 you know, hopefully this won't be the case. Anymore. Well, Andrew and McClellan upset Barkley win in Super Ward Six. That was huge, yes. also, mm -hmm. um, in terms of a change right. on council. Um, who wants to react to that or talk about that? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ahead, just Roger. say this: it, it's it's rare when an incumbent who runs for office again loses. Um, you don't see that happen too often on the on the local city councils here. Mm -hmm. it, it the, the power of incumbency, especially. Um, in a non-November election, when the turnout is usually lower, it, it is so hard to to oust uh, an incumbent. Chesapeake rarely have incumbents been beaten in in recent years. In either the city council. As a or matter of fact, board. the mayor was voted right back in. He was unopposed. He was unopposed. But the Obviously three not. the three council members in Chesapeake who were running for re-election, uh, all won. Too. Some some were close, but they all won. And the four school board members also, I right. believe, in Chesapeake, right. they also won too. So so our elections are going on. Wait, stay tuned. <laughs> but then you also said, hey, did you talk about Hampton? You know, Hampton, you had a yes, change. Yes, Hampton, right. Hampton absolutely. Wallace we did Hampton have an Hampton was, upset. was upset. It was an incumbent, mm -hmm. long-time history, city manager and then mayor. And people said, uh, I think they got George Wallace fatigued. <laughs> and so they put in. Uh, Do you think that's Donnie the reason? Tuck? You think that's why they voted in Donnie Tuck? That's part of what people have been saying, and then also I thought I think the voter turnout was was down. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand in Norfolk, uh, how, the how voter much, turnout how, was all, was actually up. Was so, yeah, yes, it was about double from the, from from the last one. Yeah. But how much of that was was personality? Um, how much was that in a, a decision? by voters that they wanted a different personality in the in the I think, that, I think that was probably some of it. I think it was that and low to, low voter turnout kind of speaks to disinterest. And Donnie Tuck was talking a lot about transparency and mm -hmm. doing things differently in the city. And George Wallace having been the city manager, people know when cities where you don't have a strong mayor model, the city manager pretty much runs, right. you know, mm -hmm. the city. And mm -hmm. so he had been running the city for so several years. And so, well, yeah. I do. We do know that Steve Cornelius, who has been fighting 
feverish, feverishly mm-hmm. to make sure that the um, uh, Fort Monroe uh, stays as a national park and so forth was very much in favor of Donnie Tuck because mm-hmm. Donnie spoke of working with that. So it'll be interesting to see how that all turns out. Okay, I want you guys to listen to a clip. Now, this was from our Another View anniversary show that aired on September the 11th, 2015. Let's play the clip. People are sick and tired of it. And and Trump is, has a great show going on. And let me tell you, he's going to get the nomination. He's going to get it. Oh, you, you heard, heard it here first. first. You heard it here first. Now, that was Dr. Eric Claville, <laughs> constitutional law, political science, and history professor at Hampton University. <laughs> he also does the Claville Report here on Another View. He nailed it. <laughs> yeah, he did. And that was in 2015. That was September right. 11th of 2015. Wow. So Before any primaries or caucuses have been held. Absolutely. And yeah. he was right there yeah. on top of it. So what do you guys think about that? We were the talking about that... it on my show this past Wednesday. I had him on. I said, I'm going to give you your props. I had him on. He, you, know, <laughs> you know, he was he was being humble but gloating <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of it, and again, as I remember that conversation, we were – no one saw this coming, but we were sort of somewhat in agreement in the the change the, or the difference in the electorate that may have been coming, which is what he was arguing, which is that, you know, just like what we saw with the Tea Party movement mm-hmm. and what we saw with the uh, Occupy Wall Street, there's, there's this rumbling of people being sick and tired, as he said at the beginning, tired of business as usual and this whole political um, class, which if you listen to Paris, say, uh, Sarah Palin, which, you know, she's got a point. <laughs> There's no political don't. class of how things are done and just people being very tired of that and wanting something different and willing to to blow the whole system up. And I'm just, you know, it was shocking to all of us that they would turn to Trump. But I get, you know, because Trump is a consummate insider just from the business side. I yeah. mean, he, yeah. he's he been, is. but he's an insider that's an outsider. And because I think he's that's not what a political people, insider. Yeah, that's the, what people uh, the, went well, yeah. well, he's been very good at recreating himself or or basically saying things and, and getting people to believe them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, <laughs> he's outsourced jobs. Uh, he uses the system as it is to get whatever he can for his businesses. Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure why the common everyday individual – wants that type of person who has who has obviously not really had their interests well, at heart well, all along. I, Donald Trump has exploited the weaknesses in the Republican Party. Uh, they haven't appealed to certain uh, uh, certain folks or folks who are angry. And I'm mm-hmm. talking about your hardcore Republicans. Yeah. Uh, he and the, they we've been neglected. And I'm I'm a moderate Republican, mm-hmm. and I just don't feel that they've responded to my needs. They certainly haven't done much in terms of uh, diversity. Uh, not that Donald Trump is doing that, but Donald Trump has touched a nerve uh, with folks who are saying that we're sick of it. We're sick of the politicians. They keep talking. They promise just enough to get reelected, and they still haven't done anything. The gridlock in D.C., we're tired of it. Let's bring somebody in who can do something different. And so anybody but a politician. Uh, so when you're down to him and, and Ted Cruz, who's disliked among his yeah. own peers, then uh, it's a no-brainer. Uh, now with Hillary, now we're deal- dealing with two folks that have high – High uh, uh, numbers of people, unfavorable, unfavorable yeah. numbers. So yeah. it's it's the lesser of two evils now. So uh, once Bernie decides, you know, to give up the ghost, then now it'll be now we can focus on on November. And I think that with Donald Trump, he's touched the right nerve, and he's and he's done it in such a non traditional way where you can offend people and do all kinds of things and still win. Uh, and so, and he's won in in different states. He just didn't win on the East Coast. He won in the South, and he most likely will win in California on the West. One of the things, that, as a marketing professional, Dolcino, they were saying that one of the things that Dolcino, um, that Dolcino, that, that Donald Trump, <laughs> Dolcino too, well, he needs to But Donald Trump is the same ultimate thing. marketer in the sense that he he can turn, like like yeah. Roger was just saying. I mean, he can take things and turn them in such a way that that you don't even know. What to believe. And yeah, I think that he does that very effectively because he speaks in non complicated language. You know, the average politician talks about bill number da 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 and the percentages da 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 da, where he just says, well, no, this is what I'm going to do. And 
the questions of how, why, to what effect, and to what extent are these policies going to be accepted in the Congress, he's not even dealing with that. And the average person don't want to hear that anyway. But are you guys concerned about the, you know, they had the Hispanics were not happy when he was in L.A. They were, they were fighting in the streets. I mean, I'm, what do you think he's going think- to do in terms of bring cohesiveness to this country. I think Definitely. it's his marketing skill, and I think it's also you seeing the the the, the internet disrupting the political the process, process now. Because exactly. before, you had to rely on the media to shape mm-hmm. a candidate in a certain way. The candidate shape himself or herself through the media in a certain way. Now, Trump is out there tweeting and saying, this is what I think. Mm-hmm. Trump is out there, you catch him on video saying one thing negative to Hispanics. The next day, he's saying something different. All that's mattering now is, what is he saying now? It doesn't matter. That whole history mm-hmm. of stuff out there doesn't matter. People get, so people, he's effectively used the media, the new tools that's available to him, bypass the whole uh, Washington scene, scene and local yeah. scene to the point where, you know, guys like Roger are not even, are not even relevant anymore in terms of being able to, being able to write a column, mm-hmm. tell a story, shape, a, a, a particular perception, and the people are like, "Look, he said the right message to the that. right people yeah, at the right I don't time care about that." So it, he well, said, "He's well, saying I'm always relevant." I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to your family, okay, yeah. So, <laughs> so um, if I mean, could Donald Trump actually pull this off and become president? Of course, of course. he's he's, he's going to be one of the major party nominees. So of course, he could pull it off. Yeah. Willie is a different question. Um, there obviously is are enough Republicans who dislike the fact that he is the nominee. Well, the, and, the and, chairman well, of the of the convention, Mr. Ryan, has said right. come out and said that he's not ready to be one hundred percent behind uh, Trump. Both, but does both, it matter? Both Bushes, Bush, uh, Bush, uh, George H W and W both have said both they're say. not going to uh, endorse him. So. I mean, maybe that doesn't mean much, but it will be interesting to see who's actually going to come out to well, vote. They do that at their peril because yeah. they're they're going to piss off the voters, and and the oh, voters well, are going to rebel. Going. They're going to they're going to rebel. And they're going to risk losing the uh, the yeah, Congress. Yeah, yeah. And so you're giving so it. You're going to give it to Hillary. Gotta, that's uh-huh. what they've got to uh, do. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's see what Murray joins us from Newport News. Hi, Murray. You're on the air. Oh, hi. Yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not exactly a Trump supporter, but I did want to just point out a, a kind of an interesting twist that probably is the, the difference between the Trump, Trump supporters and the non-Trump supporters. And that is that the Trump supporters trust him, <laughs> okay? And so if you trust him that he's a good guy, I mean, that to me in this whole political thing, it kind of comes down to whether you trust the person as a good person so that when they get there, they'll do the right thing, okay? I mean, and that's, to me, it's such a big deal. And I, not that I know to trust the guy or not, but just as an historical example, it's kind of interesting. FDR hired Joseph Kennedy to to control the stock market because he had just gamed it and made millions of dollars on it when it was going down, <laughs> right, back in the 1929, 30s, yeah. in the 30s. And, you know, because, you know, Kennedy, maybe he was a good guy. I don't know. I mean, you know, you hear all kinds of stories about Joseph Kennedy. But, I mean, Trump, I mean, conceivably people could be looking at it that way. Oh, yes, okay. he is an inside guy, mm-hmm. so he knows how to – Unrig the rigged game. Right. Okay. It just depends on whether or not you trust him and he's a good guy or a bad guy. <laughs> Thank you, Murray, for the call. We appreciate that. Carol, go ahead and yeah, react. I think Murray made a, an interesting and dramatic point is the trust factor because, okay, he has the trust. Then you look on the other side of the equation, and Hillary, the people are, who are ambivalent about her, are ambivalent because they say, we don't trust her. So it, mm. it's going to come back down to who do you trust? Yeah, he, makes, <laughs> he makes a good point because well, yeah. because the electric is saying, we know that those guys that <laughs> yeah. have been in there are, are not trustworthy. We know yeah, that. But, so yeah. this guy over here, he might be. He's an insider. He's been playing the game. Well, it's like proven. he said, it's maybe proven he because will. they're not getting anything done maybe in Congress. He will. Right. So they have a track record to, to go by. Donald Trump doesn't have a political track record. But, well, guess who just joins us? Dr. Eric Laville. Hello, Eric. You're on the air. You know he got to get his flowers. <laughs> Hello, Barbara. Hello, round table. Hello. Hey, Hello. Let's all bow. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, everybody has their day, and uh, that was just my little small, small time in the spotlight, but it's not over. What I wanted to do is... <laughs> time expand- in the spotlight <laughs> or what? <laughs> no, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I'm teasing. But, you know, what I wanted to do is expound upon the question, can Trump win? Um, 
<clears throat> I believe, now listen to me, I really believe that at this point, the race is neck and neck. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you look at Hillary Clinton, she is not winning her voters by, mm-hmm. by a landslide. The <laughs> DNC has the same problem as the RNC. <clears throat> Their voters feel disenfranchised, and they're showing up saying this in droves by voting for Bernie Sanders. Secondly, I believe that Trump, and like everyone else at the round table, stated that he is a marketer. He's a showman. He could spin the message. Remember, he wrote the book, The Art of Making the Deal. And finally, I believe that America is uh, engaging. Well, we're starting to see the backlash of what we call, and this is deep-seated racism that I'm talking about now, we're starting to see the backlash of um, uh, African-American ascending to the highest office. There's going to be a backlash from that, and they're going to wake up the sleeping giant, which are disenfranchised white males uh, in the poorly educated, educated that feel that America has left them behind. So right now it is neck and neck. Hmm. Okay. Who wants to react? Hey, that's, that's Trump's uh, motto. We're going to make America great again. And that's how that, that group that he's talking about, that's how they are registering that. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, go ahead, I, go ahead, Roger. I'm not yet convinced that you won't get the number of independents to come out to the polls and the number of Democrats to come out to the polls, that that won't be enough to get Hillary over. The question is, you know, what's what's going to be the amount? Because if you have uh, disaffected Republicans who don't like Trump and and think this man should be, point, huh? you know, the, the uh, traits that he's shown, um, his reaction to slights or to being questioned about certain topics, you, you know, a lot of individuals think, is that the guy we really want to be in the head of the military, be in the head of foreign policy? Is, well, is that something that we really want? Is, you know, where's the stability that you would want well, the in, here, in the though, president? I think, Roger, I think the X factor is going to be who he chooses as his running mate. So if he has somebody who can count, who can perhaps neutralize some of that doubt, uh, you know, with somebody but, that is like that but, but, may help. Yeah, but but people vote for the president. They don't really vote for the ticket. They well, vote for the president. No, but if if we have someone that's that's uh, that is liked, like a Rubio, um, that they feel that is just a heartbeat away from the presidency, I think that will help neutralize I, and bring in some of his support. I, I think that only hurt. The, I think that person only hurts you. I think Sarah Palin only hurt. Her, she was the, a weak candidate. She but was to a weak reference candidate. the earlier caller mm-hmm. mentioning Kennedy, you I mean, mentioned Joe Kennedy, but mm-hmm. his son JFK right. uh, uh, pulled in LBJ yeah. because he wanted yeah. to get to get south, south, and that yeah. helped him. It, it so, doesn't yeah. seem that that has really had the same effect since 1960s, 1970s. Uh, um, so, okay, we got about five minutes left. I want to get to this last. Oh, uh, thing. oh speaking of president. <laughs> so, <exactly. laughs> what a segue. President Bob, you just segue. on it today. You just <laughs> transitioned. President uh, Obama made his last appearance oh, as I president at the White House Correspondents Dinner last weekend. He was funny and charming and even dropped the mic. Mm. But then I comedian Will, Larry Wilmore came to the mic and the laughter came to a screeching halt. And at the end, he called the president the N-word, albeit ending in an A as opposed to an ER. So Not what? sure that it matters. <laughs> but I I was watching that whole dinner. Mm-hmm. And when Larry got up to do his bit, I, I ached for him because he was so bad. Yeah. So yeah. I never got to. He wasn't funny. I never got to the N word because I had to go. I had to turn the channel. <laughs> so I'm just curious as to what you all think about that. Did he take that too far? Yeah. <laughs> you did. Yeah, so, I loved it. There, I think there are certain things that you can say in certain formats. This wasn't one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, we've we've had discussions about this about this slur. I'm not for it. I'm not for it that all the rappers and other folks that, that use it, I don't think that they know history or they have a very shallow uh, appreciation for history. I don't like it. And I think that this was totally inappropriate. And I like Larry Wilmore as a comic. I think he, he's, uh, I, I liked him when he was on The Daily Show. Um, but this was just wrong. And uh, I wonder, I, I wonder if he's having second thoughts. I saw the Q&A he did with The Washington Post later on. But 
it was just inappropriate. Carol, now, you, you had a different take, Carol. Well, I felt bad for him because I, as you do, when he was, I understood the jokes. I thought, I thought they were personally funny, but I think that everything is context. And so in a certain situation and in a certain cycle with certain people there, that those jokes were not going to go over. And part of the role of a comic is a show person. And you watch the audience and all. The last comment, again, that that word does not bother me. Words don't affect me that much. But I did think it was inappropriate. Now, if it had been in a private setting, he and the president joking, their families, yeah. But in that context, no. Don't say no. Uh, ditto. Uh, I think that, one, he wasn't funny. I just, I, 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 that was obvious, and and and, I, and I've seen I've seen the, the the event in the past, and they've had some pretty good folks up there, uh, but I just his jokes just weren't on. I don't know if it was a timing issue, the writing, or what have you. He still defends it, uh, but uses the uh, but when the Obama dropped the mic, well that was a, that, that was, was that was kind of a hood uh, move. It wasn't what you call presidential, so that kind of opened it up to say. Uh, I, I understood what he meant by the gesture, but it, that wasn't the audience to do it in front. As, as Roger was saying, Roger doesn't like the word at all. But there is time you, if you had a, you know, not even if you had a, in a private setting, but not yeah. in front of a the world to see, and you using this term to um, address the president of the United States. He's the he's first black, black white. president. Of the, of yeah, the so you don't want to use <laughs> that because I mean okay. I understand that brothers do that, you know, because it's it's kind of a, a code thing. But mm-hmm. that wasn't the context to do it in front of that audience. It's sort of like sharing a piece of our culture with folks that are not going to understand That's that culture good. out of context. You get the last word, Will. Right. I get the last word? You get the last word. You got I, a minute and a half to do it. Oh. <laughs> I, kinda, I push okay, back. I kind of side with Carol. I didn't think that he was that bad. I think that his presentation, he was playing to that room, and he was also playing to the camera, a broader audience. Yeah. And he's his, his kind of dry humor doesn't come across that well maybe in yeah, video. He just didn't and in that room of journalists, that he room. was going in <laughs> on the journalists. So they wasn't feeling what he was saying yeah. anyway. But I defend his right to I I don't I don't use the word in that in that context other than in endearment and in private. But as a comic, I like what he attempted to do. And and I would encourage him not to back off of what he tried to do, because that's what comics do. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to make us un- uncomfortable. It's a whole tradition for yeah. that. We need them in society. And I'm ca- I'm cautious of some of the people who don't like what he did, that they're more worried about what white folks think and the white gaze of looking in and on a black conversation. He was trying to flip that. He was really trying to flip that, and his execution was off. And I, but I, I, I think that what he attempted to do, I support what he attempted to do as a comic. Last you know, word. there are times, we're almost place, out of time. times, places, settings, and I, I think on those standards, he was that's, a that's the white gay. It was a that's fail. the white gay. We, anyway, don't yeah, let white people I'm see that. I'm off and call me white. Turn people off and call me white all the uh-huh. time. Will they do? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> Okay, and next week, I the know. paperback <laughs> test. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. You know what, Roundtable, thank you so much for being here. We are not going to do the transition music. I'm just going to go on and close the show. So thank well, you, everybody, music. for joining us today. Have, have you had a chance the to Bojangles download the WHRO Media app yet? It's the perfect way to listen to Another View live or catch the podcast. We're on Facebook, Ow. so like us. And I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham Lee. You guys are awful next week a topic that we all need to pay attention to seriously bullying and how and why it happens and how to stop it our theme music was composed and performed by jay sennett lisa godley is our show producer victor bowen is our audio engineer and carla johnson answered our phones i'm barbara ham lee make it a wonderful weekend happy mother's day everyone for all the moms out there and let's get together again next friday at noon for another view. <laughs> you-